What's up, nerds? My name is Moya McTeer, and I'm the host of ExoLore, a show about facts based world building. I'm an astrophysicist and a folklorist and a science communicator, and I love imagining fictional worlds. But the problem is that I don't know enough about how our world works to build a fictional one all on my own. So I started ExoLore, uh, which is a show where I interview experts in other fields. They're psychologists and biologists and architects and ethnomusicologists, you know, really cool people with really amazing talent and brilliance and together we imagine the life and culture on an alien planet it's a different alien planet each time uh, in today's episode we're going to be talking about a volcano world with a geophysicist who studies natural disasters a political scientist and a biologist who studies sex determination in turtles so uh yeah let's go hi everyone thanks so much for agreeing to be on this new virtual version of ExoLore. I'm really excited to have you. Uh, first, I'd love to have you all introduce yourselves. So, Thea, you're at the top of my screen. Do you want to go first? Tell us um, a little bit about you. Sure. Um, my name is Thea Gessler. I am a graduate student at Iowa State University studying um, sex determination in turtles. Um, yeah, so my background's in genetics and evolutionary biology, and I'm interested in the plasticity of sex determination. That's so cool. Uh, I have a giant tattoo of turtles going down my back. So <laughs> I, I have a soft When is that revealed? Turtles. Is that partway through this show? or Yeah, halfway through the show, there's actually a striptease portion. <laughs> <laughs> here, here for it. <laughs> um, Mika, you want to go next? All right. Hi, I'm Mika McKinnon. I'm a geophysicist and disaster researcher. I'm currently looking at landslides on asteroids, but I also work with earthquakes, tsunami, pretty much anything like that. I um, have a large collection of rocks next to me just because. Why not? I always have to have rocks inside arm's reach. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoy all of your uh, threads on Twitter about, uh, you know, identifying different rocks and, and where different rocks come from. So big fan. Um, Andrea, what about you? Hi, uh, I'm Andrea jones -Roy. I don't do anything nearly as cool as uh, <laughs> our other scientists. Uh, I'm a political scientist. Uh, I host a show called Ask a Political Scientist every Thursday on the Caveat uh, uh, YouTube channel at 7. Uh, and I study in particular uh, how authoritarian governments use the media and when the media is a force for good or bad. Uh, in look in both democracies and autocracies. Sadly, these days the uh, the news in democracies is insanely relevant to my research on autocracies. But we'll leave that there, and hopefully our planet will not fall into that trap. Yeah. I feel like you and I have a lot of overlap in how things go. It's like people doing things terribly wrong, or planets doing things yeah. terribly wrong. Either way, everybody dies in the end. <laughs> yes. Well, maybe we can construct a world where uh, things go terribly wrong, but people don't die. Um, so yeah, that's, hoping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's what we're here to do. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen ExoLore before, the whole point of this show is that we're going to use our collective expertise and imagination to figure out what the life and culture on an alien planet could be like. Um, you, Whatever you say goes. So if you uh, want to say that the government on this planet, Andrea, is totally authoritarian and they rule their people with an iron fist, you can do that. If you want to create your... like, I'm tempted. <laughs> I'll say I'm tempted. Yeah, whatever you want. Um, yeah. Mika, if you want to create your ideal natural disaster response team, you can do that too. Just like whatever you want to exist on this planet, we're going to make it happen. Uh, so are you ready to hear about the planet? Yes. Yep. Cool. And can can we move there is my main question. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this is not a real planet. So ah. um, some a, a common question I get is, are these real exoplanets? Because that's what I study as an astrophysicist, planets outside of our solar system. And the sad truth is that we just don't know enough. We mm. can't learn enough details about real exoplanets to sure. know what they're like. So we, okay. we can't figure out if they have uh, weird atmospheres or... Uh, tectonic plate movement or anything like that. Not right. with our current technology. Okay. Well, um, we'll save this for the future when we can. Exactly. Uh, so this imaginary planet is one that has a lot of volcanic activity. Mm -hmm. 
I, I don't know if there's any sort of quantification for volcanic activity here on Earth. Mika, that's maybe something you can weigh in on. Uh, but this planet just has a lot of volcanoes going off all the time. There actually is a moon in our solar system called Io. It's one of Jupiter's moons, and it's a very volcanically active world. I think it's the most volcanically active body in our entire solar system. So you can imagine that this planet is kind of like that. Um, except for that one difference, Everything else is exactly like Earth. So it's the same size. It orbits the same type of star. It has a moon. Uh, it has water and the same atmospheric composition. It just has a shitload of volcanoes going on. Uh, right. my, my first question for Mika, because I just don't know enough about volcanoes, is uh, would volcanic activity affect other things on the planet, other natural disasters? Like, Is it tied to seismic activity at all? All right, so the whole reason we have an atmosphere in the first place is because we have volcanoes. They're, oh. they're the original source of gas that we have coming out. Um, but the only reason that we get to keep that atmosphere is because we have a liquid iron outer core that has the magnetic field, which then protects that atmosphere from constantly being stripped off. So having the volcanoes alone is not enough to guarantee that we have an atmosphere. But we're going to say, hey, this plant has the same interior going on. Exactly. Next question is going to be, are we talking about volcanoes that are similar to um, Hawaii? So ones that are on oceanic plate and are really gentle, effusive volcanoes. They produce great big, huge domes like um, Olympus Mons on Mars is like this. Or are we talking about things more like Krakatoa or Mount St. Helens that are like those sharp pyramid volcanoes with a lot of silica, which is glass, a lot of silica, a lot of quartz that traps all the gas and then you have big violent eruptions. Those two things are, you're going to have them in different places. Some are going to be on land, some are going to be an ocean, and it's its inherent to that situation. But we're going to say it's like Earth, so you've got a mix of land and of ocean, so you're going to have a mix of both the dome volcanoes and the pyramid volcanoes. Great. Next yeah. bit is, you said there's going to be smoke. There's no smoke from volcanoes Wait, at really? all. And ash oh. isn't ash. It's actually tiny shards of glass. I feel like I've been lied oh. to my entire life. Yeah. No, there's there's no smoke from volcanoes. That's all ash. And all of that ash is not like fireplace ash, not like burnt trees or whatever. It's teeny tiny shards of glass. That's Wait, where does the glass come from? So that's what happens when you have rock that is like liquid molten rock and then you fling it into the air and it cools down really fast. It's itty bitty teeny tiny bubbles. And you've seen this before in obsidian, but oh. all those microscopic bits, everything that looks like those big dark clouds, that's all glass. That's so cool. So never huff a volcano. Is our lesson here? I, I got to change uh, my whole afternoon plans. Okay, yeah, All right. yeah. Just, just no, no volcano huffing. Okay, um, and there's a whole bunch of like toxic gases that come out of this. So we talk about this in Hawaii. We talk about volcanic fog. Vog is like these cool. low-lying clouds of toxic gas, and it can actually go down the sides of a volcano and then settle down into the valleys and then kill everything in the valley with mm. carbon dioxide uh, and no air. So that would be for our biologists to talk about in terms of <laughs> what happens if you have so much volcanic activity like do we do we fill all of the valleys with like this differential layer of no oxygen in the valleys because i don't know hmm. so there's that hmm. then we've got mid-ocean ridges spreading we don't think of those as being volcanoes but if you've got a lot of volcanic activity you're going to have a lot of tectonic movement going on and those hmm. plates are going to spread so you're constantly getting that new sea floor which means you're going to get more things like uh, hot springs, like um, the undersea version of that would be the the black smoker vents, um, which is where you find all the ridiculous extremophiles that do things like eat gold or eat arsenic and poop gold. And you're like, uh, how is this a creature? I don't, biologist, please help. Um, <laughs> that is what I do in my spare time, but we'll set that aside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like everybody who eats toxic waste and creates precious metals, that's what you do at deep ocean yeah. vents. Um, Regular Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Daily checklist. Um, so we've got that problem. Then we have, okay, so you're we asking about earthquakes. Every time we've got that magma moving around, it makes the earth vibrate. Everything makes the earth vibrate. Right now we're seeing globally seismic noise dropping because people are sheltering in place. And we can actually tell whether or not people are obeying their shelter in place Whoa. by how much that background seismic noise is dropping. And that's just from people like walking? Walking, traffic, um, normally you can see rush hour, you can see tea breaks when people all go outside at the same time and leave, you see a spike in little seismic noise traffic. 
Uh, we can see like ocean waves crash crashing. We can see lovers' lanes, which is the most oh. entertaining to me of all our unusual seismic signals. <laughs> Be like, oh, you thought you were alone in the woods. You're not. Oh. Um, what about the two exactly two times I did a ten minute high intensity workout video? Does that does that bring our numbers back up? Because I worked super yeah. hard for those two ten minute intervals over four weeks. Get that like seismic activity happening. Make the yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Just Everything it's vibrates. Planks and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to have a lot of <laughs> volcanic activity. You're going to constantly have a magma shifting around, which means you're going to have a really high background noise, which means whoever's on this planet isn't going to have a very good idea of, of what's going on inside because you're going to, well, hmm, you're going to have huge amounts of background <laughs> noise, but you also have a huge amount of source vibration traveling through. So when you say background noise, do you mean like, can they literally hear it? Can you hear this activity? For the most part, no. Okay. So it is a pressure wave, though. It's just a pressure wave too low frequency for us to hear it. So it's a really low rumble that we don't get to hear because our ears are pathetic. Great. Um, I want to save plenty of time to get into the bio. So yeah. are, is that... Yeah, also, that's a great point because, hey, maybe the biology is going to respond to having like this constant, like low level rumble happening all the time everywhere. Yeah. Mm. So let's let's move on to the biology. Um, given the amazing just like crash course in volcanic activity that we just got, <laughs> what types of, of traits or characteristics do you think that people on this planet might evolve to like deal with their harsh environment? And, and Thea, maybe you can weigh in first. Yeah, so when you say volcanic activity, what I think of is like I envision organisms having like probably a really quick lifespan. So things that have they reproduce a lot and they reproduce fast so that they can get their offspring out and onto that next generation. Is that because it's just so dangerous that if you don't like you want to make sure people yeah, will survive? Like that risk of disruption. Um, so you can't count on having a long lifespan, like for example humans are used to now um we see examples in other organisms like rodents they're kind of your characteristic quickly reproducing species or insects so things like that um i also think about dispersal is probably going to be really important so anytime you get these eruptions if they're going to take out a whole area of the globe um organisms are going to want to be able to disperse to a new environment so that they can survive or their offspring can survive. So dispersal traits could be important. So um, kind of one of the great dispersers are like palm trees and, and like the coconuts that just kind of float across the ocean and they've kind of colonized the world because they're able to disperse far distances because of the, the characteristics yeah. of their seeds. So I imagine traits like that. What would a trait like that look like in a, like a living sentient being? Hmm. So in humans... Or something like that's a good question um well the key is to be able to like kind of weather out the storm so you're going to want to be able to maybe like recede into something maybe like a turtle shell to okay. kind of like get away from and protect yourself from that extreme environment um and get away from it or also um birds they can fly they can fly to a new environment so any sort of like trait that allows you to move away um or like change your behavior in such a way to move to move to new conditions and turtles can yeah. swim right they could escape mm -hmm. through the water yeah so like sea turtles they could swim across oceans um a lot of turtles are also aquatic so they can swim across lakes so yeah swimming swimming would be a great trait as well I would be very down to have a, like just like a super powerful race of turtle people. Yes, <laughs> on this planet. Yes. <laughs> what about like there's that whole collection of sharks that live inside a volcanic cave where they're massively adapted to handle high acidity. Mm. So one of the things volcanoes mm -hmm. produce is they produce a lot of um, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide reacts with ocean water. You get carbonic acids in there. You get um, uh, a buffering happening. If you have a lot of volcanic activity, you won't have um, uh, you'll have high acidity oceans, which means you won't have many seashells. Mm -hmm. So the, the ocean, the turtle shells would dissolve. If they're, they're not calcium carbonate, are they? They're I don't like to think about that. Like, 
Like clamshells would dissolve in the ocean, but I don't know what a turtle shell is made out of. It's like, it's it's bony, so there is that calcium oh. element, but there's also cartilage, so it's also tissue based. Hmm. Um, so it's kind of a mix of factors. We so, could make it out of something else. True. Um, yeah. What would be a uh, a good material to survive this acidic water and acidic uh, environment? What's that? Hi, right. Fool's gold. Oh, so they're going to be golden turtles. Oh, yeah. so turtles. gold turtles. That's better than my idea. I was like, plastic, obviously. Like, wait, maybe there's not plastic. So, okay. <laughs> so could right. we incorporate pyrite into a biological structure? So it's got, it's got a little cubicle structure, molecularly speaking. It looks like salt does. Okay. So I would, I mean, biology and chemistry are not my thing at all. <laughs> but if you could have, like, insert, oh, insert little cubes and just replace which cubes you have with pyrite cubes those are really volcanic and and handle that sort of environment yeah, I mean, well biological structures often have like really cool organizational patterns so mm -hmm. i imagine that could like be incorporated somehow to grow use that as like your base yeah if they eat it yeah or yeah, they they incorporate it into their body and use that as like a framework munch on the volcanic rocks and be like, I shall eat the pyrite, like, you know, goats eat salt, and then just have that as part of my shell, because calcium carbonate is just not going to exist. All you would have is, like, anytime you have calcium carbonate in a highly acidic ocean, it would just bubble at you, and you'd have, like, a fizz coating that dissolve. That's so cool. All right, so we have our fool's gold turtle people, uh, mm -hmm. and they get the, the pyrite into their shells by eating it. So we have part of their diet covered. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd like to start thinking about what they actually do, how they behave in this environment. Uh, Mika, I don't know if your work covers uh, kind of procedures for how you should respond to natural disasters. Yeah. So what, what types of procedures do you think they might put in place? So I'm going to tie this directly into the political chunk here so we can yes. also integrate Andrea in it, into it. So you're going to be in a situation where you have constant high disruption events mm -hmm. on such a reoccurrent basis that normality is disruption. Mm -hmm. So, but it's always going to be localized. So the volcano, it's... Um, Every time you have a really, really big eruption, it can send enough ash high enough in, into the atmosphere that you have a, 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 like a dark layer that cools everything. So you'll have a year or two where everything is colder. Mm -hmm. But anytime you have just small eruptions, it takes out that island and everywhere else is fine. So mm -hmm. you have to pick everybody up and leave and wait for that island to settle down and cool down. And it takes like 20 years before the lava fully cools again and maybe a hundred years to break it back down into plants, but then you could like go back to that island and mm -hmm. go settle again. So it, it almost need to be a nomadic sort of thing happening with constant disruption. Mm -hmm. Your infrastructure couldn't be very big. You'd have to have like a lot of oral storytelling happening. So what are your, if mm. I give you that situation, what could mm. you do in terms of yeah. politics? Create your ideal environment for this world, Andrea. Wait, so what do we mean by, wh why can't we have, like, written communication? This is very intriguing. Would it all just dissolve or something? Well, I mean, you could have it, but where would you store it if you're uh -huh. constantly having to evacuate? Right. Right? Like, Excellent. you have to be able to pick up and go all of the time. Yeah. So you're going to need to prioritize what you take with you. Mm. So you'd have to get through, like, to get through the written into the technology mm -hmm. era. How are you going to do that when... Right. You're not going to bring your collection of Harry Potter books yeah, every time you have to evacuate. Yeah, you're constantly having Got your it. libraries burned Got down, it. like, every 15 years, all of your libraries on your Ooh, island. Are, cool. Um, I didn't even think about that part. Right. Excellent. Okay, so uh, so a lot of this is making me think, you know, going back to, to the origins of it, like, it's not obvious to me why... Well, let me back up. The question is, would they even want to have some kind of global government at all, some local governments? any kind of organizational structure. And if we're living in a world that's super nomadic, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, the history in the, United, in, in the world, in the human world on earth, you know, there were early forms of, you know, institutional organization where there were, you know, chains of villages where you would have like rules in place where you'd communicate and currency would come out to organize trade. And occasionally, 
they would, I'm really oversimplifying the origin of the nation state, but <laughs> occasionally they would have like kings or rulers who would aggregate a bunch of wealth and in exchange for, you know, being taxed, uh, that king or ruler would be expected to protect you and your community against outsiders. But all of that is predicated on everyone more or less being in one place. And, you know, early humans were nomadic. And then basically, I'm not, this is not my background, but correct me to the real scientists here. Once we got agriculture and other things, we could stay in one place. That's when we started to really see more formal government that takes the form that we have now with recorded written constitutions that last a really long time and things like that. Is that fair? Right before agriculture, et cetera, humans wandered around. Yes. That sounds right. So I'm we're in a world. Fine. Yeah, go ahead, Mika. Um, so what we do have about this in the disaster context that works even without a centralized point of government is we have the mutual aid agreements. Mm. So it's the, the trading off of resources and you could still have agriculture right. if it was aquaculture. So your right. land is constantly changing, but you could do like deep ocean fishing or you mm. could do like oyster gardens or things like that mm. and have those be stable. So we can get agriculture. Right. We move this life underwater. I mean, that would be our probably Which, more stable. Where's with our turtles? We could. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Jelly, like jellyfish and pyrite. Okay, so we can go back cool. to, all right, we've got okay. mutual aid agreements. We have cool. a variation of like wild farmed agriculture, aquaculture. Yep, yep. and that, this is also making me think of some really great work by um, a scholar named Eleanor Ostrom, who won, who was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics um, and is a political scientist. Who Wait, basically when, when was that? Oh, this was in the, oh, when did she win? I don't know when she won, but she's, she wrote in the, like, 90s, mostly. She wrote in the, like, 90s, mostly. Oh, of course. All right. Yeah. It was it's very bad, recent. But let's, let's go on. Horribly <laughs> recent, yes. <laughs> um, but she uh, wrote a lot about collective action and how you can, uh, as local communities, you can put in, in place, um, basically you can grow cultures to enforce things like preventing overfishing or hoarding of resources in ways that are much more sustainable and local rather than having an overarching government. So most this was in response to a lot of arguments about how do we make sure that people don't like overfish or factories pollute. And she said, you know, and everyone was leaning towards like large central governments to enforce these rules because they're sort of counter to markets. And she showed that in various communities um, around the world, uh, people were able to opt into this sort of cooperative tit for tat mutual respect culture that allowed us to make sure that like, I will let you fish your area, I will fish my area, and we won't you know, hoard resources for ourselves. But that's a very rare thing. And the risk is if we don't put that kind of early stage culture into place among our sentient aqua human-esque turtles, uh, that we're gonna end up on the other side of things, which is you have access to a particular natural resource, however temporarily, and then you hoard all the resources and you become this tyrant I was describing before, where mm. you are the person who's in power uh, and, and, you know, sort of rich get richer, powerful get more powerful. That said, this idea that no one can, at least based on location, really aggregate a ton of resources could be this very interesting, if we think this is normatively a good thing, this interesting shakeup every 15 years or so, at least in certain parts of the world, where the either the president or the Jeff Bezos or the whoever of the world, whether they've concentrated power or concentrated resources, kind of it all just gets shaken up and they start anew. Right. And so so early stages, I would imagine that it would be very hard for anyone to really amass much power or influence. That said, I would imagine that if, if these beings are self-interested like humans are, they would find ways to transport that power, whether it's reputation or carrying certain precious metals with them that are particularly valuable or, or carrying some sort of weapon. Maybe they develop a nuclear weapon that's not that big or whatever. So I'm very worried in how we make sure that we protect this species from one or two let's say tyrants from overtaking mm -hmm. um, right. yeah so go ahead mika where where do you said the volcanoes produce the pyrite so are we going to yeah. have these pockets of pyrite by each volcano so are these going to be like our our wealth centers because everyone so depends this, on what them? i was thinking is what does wealth look like when you have yeah. a lot of volcanoes because volcanoes produce like all the random exotic metals like you've got all these random concentrations of everything from the deep earth coming up but what you don't have is soil, mm. right? Like if you're yeah. constantly coating your that could become the land surface that, with fresh right? rock, then suddenly mm. your most valuable resource is poop. <laughs> yeah, because right? you need to recoat your soil all the time. So you need to break down your rock 
into mineral components. Yeah. So having like a little collection of plants or fungi or seeds or whatever that speed up that rock breakdown process, that weathering process and weathering tends to happen. So um, rocks are most stable under the conditions under which they form. So just like okay. grabbing another rock. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Right. We have here a rock that it looks all brown and rusty in places. Mm -hmm. It literally is rusty. This is a very iron rich rock. If I had a magnet, it would stick to it. Cool. The longer it's been at the surface, it's been exposed to air, to water, it has rusted. So all these rocks with constant volcanism are constantly forming at the surface. So they're really resistant to weathering. So you need to get them under weird circumstances. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have slower weathering rates. It's, so it's soil is your precious metal. It's like your, your yeah. ultimate resource is soil. You're right. So that might be what ends up being a currency. If we assume that currencies are inevitable as opposed to just sort of a barter trade system. The right. question though, is, is there a possibility in this world for something like, I'm blanking on the name of it, but you know, is it up in Norway where they store all those seeds in some yeah, kind of like, all barred. Mm -hmm. will people start putting soil into things like that? Would that be like the banks that people could have and that could protect your wealth? So we can make that happen. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's good or bad, right? As far as from a, so, so I guess, so let's, going back to the politics of it. So we want to make sure, presumably, that this is a place where these creatures can, you know, I, I like to think this is normative and it's my opinion, but live in a place where they all have access to enough materials to eat and live and thrive and all those things. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully they can create and enjoy and consume some kind of art or, or whatever it is that, that um, this being uh, likes to, to do. Um, and also can live in a way that protects them from fear of, invasion right and so typically at least when i think of nomadic societies i think of because my grip on history is very slender uh <laughs> like the dothraki in game of thrones where it's like you have to go and you're fighting and you're conquering and it's never you can't just live and enjoy your life right and so some form of world government or or regional governments would be helpful for this kind of protection right and mm -hmm. the other thing that government can be good for is providing things like infrastructure which could help with the, the dispersion that we were talking about before and, you know, governments, as we're seeing in the current world, can be, they're not the only solution, but they can be useful for disaster mitigation, like natural disasters, like the pandemic. They don't always do a good job. And there's a lot of, you know, <laughs> garbage research. Uh, there's really good research that shows depressingly that dem democracies are particularly bad at protecting citizens because of the incentives around elected officials to show that they recovered well from a disaster. And mm -hmm. there's not much reward for preparing and avoiding one. So... Yeah. So how do we put into place some kind of structure, and maybe it doesn't even need to look like government, to, to get people the various benefits of what would look like government, infrastructure if we need it, protection from fear of being attacked at all times, uh, some kind of rule of law, but without this, like, you know, someone putting all the soil into some, uh, you know, underwater vault and thus harnessing all the power and subjecting everyone to a miserable life. So the... Look, look, I imagine that it takes a lot of soil to do any yeah. any type of process on these rocks, right? Like you just need so much soil mm. that your own personal store of it probably isn't very useful, right, Mika? Well, I mean, how much do you need to plant to grow? And do our turtles care about land? Mm. Like if they're primarily aquatic species, then this mm. whole concept falls apart. Yeah, if that's right. Eating, like jellyfish and pyrite. And they're so also we need to go back to the biologist here on <laughs> what what do our turtles value? Yeah. Yeah, like what? What are their biological? You know, needs? What are their needs, and we'll figure out which of those is scarce. I don't know that soil is necessarily essential because there are plants that don't require soil. They're mm. less common, but like there's like the like those air plants that are yeah, sold in air plants exactly keeps in <laughs> green point. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> I'm just like everything <laughs> is inside reach for me right now. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, what kind of magical world are you living in? I can't read anything. <laughs> I'm pretty much like Mary Poppins. I just pull every, I have a bag of holding this just outside the screen limits. And I just kind of keep reaching and things show up. Do our turtles need a giant uh, fake painting that I bought on the internet four years ago? Because I have that to show up. Yeah. Great. How do turtles perceive things? Like, do they, are they primarily light or do they do like water pressure sort of thing? Like, what are their primary senses so we understand what their art looks like? So. They don't have like ears per se, but they can sense like vibrations. They have eyes, mm. obviously. Um, I believe smell is pretty important. So aromas. Even underwater? Does I was wondering the same. That? 
well underwater? You get like particles. So it's just a, a different thing happening. But so how do they hunt for jellyfish? How do they know where the jellyfish are? I don't actually study sea turtles. Um, okay. I imagine. Who knows? I'm maybe thinking, the I'm ripples of the... Know where they just kind of follow the currents. Maybe. Yeah, so all this volcanic activity is going to do some really weird things to currents as well, right? Because you have all these heat spots. Mm -hmm. um, literal hot spots. Uh, so two primary types of volcanism. You can have... Um, Tectonic plates pull apart, move side to side, or come together. And if they come together uh, and they're both continental plates, they crash up and you get the Himalayas. But if one is oceanic, or both are oceanic, the colder, denser plate will go underneath, which will be the ocean plate or the older ocean plate if you've got two of them together. And that plate mm. going underneath melts and feeds the volcanism on top. The other type of volcanism you can get is you have uh, like a, a hot spot, is think of it like a candle inside the, the mantle, and the plate going on top produces a series of volcanoes. And that'd be like Hawaii. So you have the Emperor Hawaii chain is the emperor is the oldest of now dormant volcanoes. Mm. And that the plate has pulled across. And now the most active volcanoes are on the youngest island. So you could have the wealthiest people living on the oldest island where there's mm. no longer active vul volcanism. Mm. And then if you are on the lowest of your social class, then you're going to be in the most hazardous location, which is the biggest, youngest island. I like right. this. No, I we're getting, it. I hate yeah, this, yeah. I hate it too. Fun. We're getting to a very like current day climate change situation where you oh, know yeah. wealthy t are in positions where they tend not to be affected directly by this. Yeah, but we yeah. we still haven't decided what would make a person wealthy. Like right. What, what resources yeah. would they have amassed? I have a question. Globally, how often? How, how, like, so, so there's going to be a, the occasional big uh, volcano that, if I'm remembering correctly, that kind of messes up the atmosphere for everyone. But most of the uh, eruptions are going to be these localized ones. And so there will be periods where on other parts of the globe, people are relatively unscathed, right? As long as they're more localized. Does that mean it's possible that, say, there could be an area of this globe for, that could go hundreds of years without any kind of disruption? Or are we talking like, you know, just a few years, and then it's, I, I don't know how active these volcanoes are. Uh, so, right now, there's about 40 erupting volcanoes somewhere on the planet, right now. A actively right now. Wait, no, just right now, today, right. right now, there are 40 eruptions going on. I can see, like, four outside my here. window, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a very quiet and calm year, um, and on an average year, we have about 50 to 70 volcanoes producing about 40 to 60 eruptions because several of these volcanoes have like either continuous ongoing eruption or erupt multiple times anything like that hmm. um and any one region can have a whole bunch of things going on so in the pacific northwest where i am where one plate going underneath another we have mount st helens it's our famous eruption from the 1980s we've also got baker we've got rainier that continues up into canada where we do not even have a volcano monitoring program hmm. we've got the exact same geology we have the exact same sets of volcanoes, but our last eruption was over a century ago. Mm. So we're just mm. not yeah. monitoring. Yeah. 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 That, that, brings up a, <laughs> uh, that brings up a really interesting point. Um, it's you, When you're world building, it's important to talk about the roles that will be common in society. And so I imagine mm. that, especially because we, we still haven't solved this problem of who has, like, how do you get powerful? How do you get wealthy? Mm -hmm. I can imagine a, a situation where the most powerful, the wealthiest people are those who have developed technology or like the ability somehow to detect and predict very accurately these volcanoes. Yeah. And so not only can they move to parts of the world that are going to be safe so they can keep all of their resources, but they can yep. also make money or whatever by telling other people when it's like this private out. jet elite crowd that also influences policy and makes predictions. And as we were talking about all of this, um, I know almost nothing about religion, but I become worried that there might be, or not worried, that's a bit a bit uh, biased to me. I become uh, uh, curious about whether or not the species would develop some kind of, maybe before science, maybe alongside science, way of predicting or saying whether or not, you know, a volcano eruption happens for a reason. You start oh, yeah. having like prayers to yeah. volcano gods, or you start telling narratives uh, more like what you were saying with the powerful, where you say, well, if the volcano erupts, it's a sign that they're not happy with how you're living your life. We've seen humans do that to other humans. Oh, absolutely. The yeah. They would have some amazingly bonkers myths and yeah. on this planet. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, including a whole subculture and market of things to protect you against volcanoes that don't actually do anything <laughs> and all kinds yes. of other things. Yes. So we've got three way- ways of telling that a volcano is not just like doing its thing, mm-hmm. but is actively probably going to erupt soon. We can't do like a, a it's going to happen on this time and this mm-hmm. day in this location we can be like the odds are high right. stay away right what we do is uh we have tilt meters which are literally they just are little balance points and we wait for them to move because if you've got magma coming up and rising close to the surface getting ready to erupt it like creates bulges in the volcano mm. so you've got that then remember how i said before about how you have the seismics this is a seismometer what is you in your room <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> Uh, so this is a raspberry shake. Uh, it's a little at-home um, Arduino-driven seismometer right there. It's a little accelerometer that detects whether or not you've got vibration happening. And then we've also got in here is an air intake to do infrasound monitoring. So to tell whether or not you've got um, like a, a far away eruption would create like a sonic boom that would come through. Um, you could also use it to measure if there's a nuclear test. Um <laughs> Somebody's throwing off bombs. Yeah. Uh, and then the final way would be doing the chemistry sampling. So those would be the primary ways you'd be able to, to like actively monitor your volcanoes and be like, it is time to get out of Dodge. Mm-hmm. I'm also going to suggest the equivalent of the priest robes on this planet, which is in Canada, geoscientists and engineers go through a ceremony during which we give our ethical vows, say we're going to do our best to like stay in our lane, do what we're good at, mm-hmm. or capable of, uh, that we won't hurt others, all of that. And, and then we get those vows. A little earth ring at the end. Um, oh. And this has crossed rock oh. hammers and a seismic signal on it because I am yeah. a geophysicist. So that is that I got married to my job. Um, I love that I so much. I really have, want one. <laughs> I'm thinking we'll have an equivalent of that for if you're a volcanologist doing your forecasting, you take your vows that you will be accurate and complete in your information. Um, maybe there is no do no harm clause because clearly you can buy access to power and early warnings. Um, but having some sort of symbol of that, that is based on the, like the seismic wave Mm -hmm. would be a pretty cool symbol for when the volcanologist reigns supreme. I am currently so mad that as an astrophysicist, I don't have to take any sort of vows like a, like a geophysicist or a doctor. Like I want a vow ceremony when I go. Um, I, I would like to, this is amazing, but I would like to move on a little bit. Um, <laughs> we're not going to develop the vows now. So okay, fine. We, could, yeah. we could so easily get, get bogged down into this, but I, I want to keep it expansive. Um, so Thea, something that I would love to talk more about is, uh, ideals of beauty and here on earth, at least on average, at, when you get to the core of beauty norms, a lot of it has to do with things that are honest signals of reproductive fitness. Uh, Things like waist to hip ratios or having like healthy skin and hair or whatever. Um, So do you have ideas for what would be like good beauty standards here? So this is like the whole field of sexual selection in biology. Um, And this is why we see oftentimes these fabulous displays in birds. Uh, So I'm thinking like, since we're saying this pyrite is so important um, for building their protective shell, if you have like some way of like more effectively incorporating pyrite from like when you consume it to how you you can efficiently get it to your to your armor, I'm thinking the more sparkly and golden you are, that would probably be a really important standard of beauty. Yes. Yeah, and maybe um, since dispersal is probably going to be important because we have to get away efficiently from these like eruptions anything that would suggest that you're like big strong swimmer um so well-developed flippers would probably also be really important so <laughs> the golden i'm into the they sound like beautiful creatures i have to say <laughs> very into whatever we're describing yeah um so along with pyrite you can also get arsino pyrite with this, which is arsenic in pyrite and otherwise it's structurally exactly the same but it's silver instead of gold oh. and you'd also get that at like your deep sea vents where you've got more toxic mm. minerals so you could have like some differentiation of are you more gold or more silver of do you Ooh. have access to like the gentler nicer less deadly volcanoes or mm. the nasty ones but you're more likely to survive the really nasty ones 
Mm, um, so you yeah. kind of have like the, are you an elegant and high class turtle? Mm. Or are you like a working force tough turtle? I'm yeah. getting so nervous about oh, this distinction. <laughs> <laughs> so that's very uncomfortable. Great. But back to politics. Yeah. Well, like, that's the thing. Yeah. Golden you can have silver fight. class divide. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's one of those where it's like, you know, once you get into, there's a lot of conversations in political science about what makes for a peaceful society. And it's, I'm going to really botch this whole literature, but it's sort of like, it's very easy to have a society that's very peaceful, but it's very homogeneous. So a place like Norway, where everyone kind of looks the same for the mm-hmm. most part, right? Um, places where there's like one or two major divides, whether it's over religious or ethnicity or whatever, um, that tends to be rough, like one against the other. And then if you get like to Ireland. a world where there's a lot of different varieties, you don't really get those, unless they form coalitions, you don't really get those like same kinds of like cleavages that can be really problematic. So are there other ways, hopefully, that we can, these turtles, like, are there bronze? And is there, you know, like, or, or neon, like our bioluminescence? Like if we can have more diversity, I, that would actually make me feel better, if that makes sense. Yeah. We could have, like, there'd be three main regions where inside those regions, you'd have the same basic materials. So you've got your ridges, four regions, pardon me. You've got your, your ridges spreading areas where everything is kind of calm and gentle. Um, and you have like access to pretty much straight up mantle sampling of what the insi- right. inside the planet looks like. You've got the, the silt coverage explosive volcanoes, the most dangerous ones. Yeah. Um, you've got your nice little gentle ocean ones. And those are going to be three very, very distinct regions. And then you can have hot spots, like hot springs or vents happening anywhere where you get the really, really exotic minerals. Um, so those would do it by exotic minerals. Do you mean they can lead to like gems, like rubies and sapphires? Because I'm picturing like we have yeah. to- that, like the way we get diamonds in the first place is because of kimberlite pipes, which are like really fast, giant volcanic eruptions. They're like an expressway from the depth to the surface, and we've never had a kimberlite expression uh, eruption in human history um, because we're very, very, very lucky so far. <laughs> oh, one more thing to worry about. Okay, thousand years or a uh, 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 hundred million years. Um, so hopefully, we'll never experience a kimberlite eruption. But if we do, um, it's just like sudden deep mantle showing up in the surface inside of a very short period of time mm. um, with diamonds mm-hmm. and okay. everything else is deep mantle fun and joy. We have the gold turtles, the silver turtles, and the diamond turtles. Um, that's great. I, I want to ask one last question because our hour is almost up. Uh, Andrea, you're a comedian. Oh, boy. <laughs> not right now that I'm, I'm just like deep in thoughts about lava lakes. So it's right. all misery from here on out. Comedy's before, canceled. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Before Mika ruined you uh, psychologically yeah. and emotionally, yeah, uh, that was you it were a me. comedian. Yes. <laughs> I, I would love us to just really grossly generalize and stereotype right now. Perfect. Uh, imagine, My favorite. Like what, what would the overall sense of humor for these uh, turtle people be? Like if, mm. if they are living under these conditions, would it be like a very dark sense of humor, a dry sense of humor? Like what? Mm. Come up, maybe come up with a joke. <laughs> yeah, it would definitely be dark. Um, I don't know that I can come up with punchlines, but I can get you to premises, which, you know, everyone knows are the hard part of these. So, cool. uh, so I could imagine a lot of, um, at least memes, if there's, if there's a version of, you know, short transmissions that maybe evaporates and they're not too heavy. I don't know if they have internet, but that would be resolving of some of the issues of carrying information. Um, where they're just like, oh, you know, this like ash clouds got me like, and they like funny faces of uh, <laughs> turtles like being depressed. Um, there'd be a lot of like push for for self care, I think, where you're polishing your rubies and your diamonds and your whatever your gold on your back, and so you could easily have a lot of comedy making fun of people who are really indulgent in self care. I would see a lot of that, um, and you know, there's going to be this underground comedy or underwater comedy scene where they're really making fun of turtles of other kinds of colors, you know, like, you know, people who are gold and maybe super reflective, like, oh, gold person comes into the party and like, you can't see what they're doing. Like it's, I feel like it would be very cruel and very dark, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. yeah. They'd also have to have something incorporating that you could at any point in time accidentally go into a topographic low and end up in one of those poison ponds yeah. or like no oxygen areas or whatever else and suffocate and die. Yeah. All you got to do is take a wrong route, head downhill, death. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a lot of suicide, um, 
less suicide jokes, I think. Mm-hmm. Probably not, not yet, not a lot of like political jokes just because everyone's so spread out. So it's going to be more about, you know, universal experiences related to, mm-hmm. to volcanoes, I would say. Like right. poor navigation would get yeah. you killed. Yeah. yeah. So, so the yeah. whole thing about like, I have such a bad sense of navigation, I went down the hill and suffocated, mm-hmm. um, which is clearly a terrible punchline. <laughs> Or just, you know, know, or or it. some jokes about you know trying to get jellyfish, you know, and smelling underwater. This it's clearly you know a lot of material right there. You know, <laughs> I, well, I don't spoil it by by delivering amazing punchlines. I'll let the <laughs> the viewer think of some jellyfish smell related comedy uh, themselves. Yeah. yeah. Bea, what were you saying? Oh, I was saying I was envisioning like some sort of jokes with regards to intelligence and like those lava pools you said and like oh people aren't smart enough to to avoid the the lava mm-hmm. pool. Mm-hmm. that kind of like, yeah i mean and oh, and yes they sink in a lava pool ah so nobody knows how to die in lava um in all of our movies we showed up like you hit lava or, like in lord of the rings where you hit lava and then you sink and and like disappear or in like um star wars that happens except for people are substantially less dense than rocks we float on rocks all the time by like walking around on them. This doesn't change just because the rock is molten. We still are floating. We're mostly water, not rock. Um, so, so dense that you'd sink into a lava pool. Hmm. I <laughs> like, love that. Yeah, yeah, what's the deal with lava pools? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, imagine a Jerry Seinfeld turtle creature on this planet. Mm-hmm. So would these lava pools then become like, like defense? mechanisms or defenses around like the wealthy people houses to mm. keep the raft. So mm. could you harness lava? That, that's like a whole big thing. So Iceland is the only place that's successfully yeah. done this. Um there's a lot of movies about trying to like harness and direct where lava is gonna go uh by like spraying water at it or whatever else and trying to redirect it. But for the most part lava just does what it's gonna do. So you would have to build your community around the lava instead of the lava around you it. Mm. Which always has the hard bit of what if the lava turn mm-hmm. next and time, I mean, which is what we see in Hawaii with like the golf courses that got taken out during the last set of eruptions. Right. Yeah, but you can also imagine that because this is so uh, integral to their lives, that they spend a lot of time and energy trying to develop technology to mm-hmm. deal with lava, and so maybe we don't have the ability to control it, but maybe they yeah. have just worked on it so much that they have developed this technology. And you can end up in places where you've got, so the the rounded volcanoes will do the slow, gentle lava flow that you can walk away from, but they happen more often. Whereas the pyramid volcanoes, the the pointy ones, have more violent eruptions that happen a lot less frequently. Mm. So you've got those very different risk approaches as Hawaii versus Pacific Northwest on this. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's in the, the Hawaiian culture concept of lava is going to do what it's going to do, mm-hmm. and you have to kind of mm-hmm. accept that every now and then the volcano is going to take away your land and that's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. Um, as opposed to uh, the um, Haida Gwaii culture is a lot less, uh, which is one of the, the First Nations tribes up here in Canada, is a lot less um, accepting of our volcanoes mm. and instead has a more confrontational relationship mm-hmm. with our, our eruptions. Like there's still tor- stories about it and there's still like this acknowledgement of it's going to win. Um, but it's more of a fight than yeah. a cooperation. And I imagine that would play out absolutely in terms of whatever broader cultural, social, political environment builds up, which is one where, yeah, it's just, you know, it, it, it's the world will happen to us and we'll do the best we can do, like a much more laissez-faire versus, you know, authoritarian grip on like, we can overcome and control the earth and mm-hmm. the this planet. So, like, does this planet have a name? Uh, no, we can come up with it now. Oh, cool. Okay. What do you think? I liked something about the Vulc- like the Vulcanist leaders or something. So, I mean, it's un- un- uncreative, but like Vulcan-esque somewhere in the name would be good. Yeah. But maybe two on the nose. I don't know. Maybe. I, 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 I don't want to step on the toes of the Star Trek franchise. I'm yeah, fair. Sued. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, maybe maybe the, the people who watch this video can come up with Very good. Um, yeah. a, an a legal name for this planet. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> that won't get me sued. Uh, but we're almost at the end of the hour and uh, I'd like the watchers of this video to like be able to find more about you. So um, Andrea, if people want to learn more about you, where can they do that? 
Sure. I am unfortunately all over the internet. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at, at Jonesroy, Jones R O O Y. And um, my website, jonesroy.com slash A A P S, is where you can find out about Ask a Political Scientist. Cool. Great. Uh, Mika, what about you? I too am pretty much everywhere under <laughs> the handle Mika McKinnon, M I K M C K I N N O N, doing a lot of things about either disasters or licking rocks got to have some taste tests happening for all these rocks. Good. What's um what's your favorite rock to lick and a rock that you just should never lick? Uh, I am particularly fond of licking sylvite. So you've actually probably had this. Halite would be table salt. Sylvite is um, the same structure, but instead of um, uh, sodium chloride, it's potassium chloride. And if you've ever had low sodium salt, that's actually 50-50 halite and sylvite. So sylvite has a very sour, almost bitter taste to it. I love it. Uh, and a rock you should never, ever, ever lick is um, uh, cinnabar, which is bright red. If you've seen those beautiful bright red carved vases um, mm. from like various Chinese dynasties, yeah, that's like mercury. And carving them was pretty much a death sentence. So, oh. like, all those artisans died early. I have so many vases I have to get rid of after this. Okay. <laughs> Our mostly made of plastic. Ah, um, I I love that I asked that question and you immediately had an answer. I don't think I've ever met anyone else who I can say that about. So yeah. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, Thea, what about you? Where can people uh, you find can, you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter um, at Thea Gessler. That is probably the best place to find me. Cool. And what do you have going on in, in life right now aside from, you know, everything? <laughs> oh. <laughs> what are you working on? Uh, grad school. Ooh. <laughs> so, yeah. Godspeed. <laughs> My tweets are just like grad school related tweets right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, same. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish you luck in your grad school journey. Thank you. We didn't even talk about grad school for these turtles. That's uh, probably for the best. Yeah. 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 Maybe they'll right. abolish grad school and spare us all. Maybe on this planet, you know how, how people here want their kids to be like doctors and lawyers and bankers? Everyone wants their kid to get a PhD in volcanology. Mm -hmm. Get that sweet ring. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> you have to do it while you're in virgin mathematics and like chemistry differentiation. It's okay. Your big, like your tool is going to be a spiky hammer. I wish my rock hammer was inside of reach. Finally, something that's not. Wow. Like, I'm shocked. Hammer. <laughs> um, actually on the closet so I can get it inside of about 30 seconds um, but having the hammer and like being able to scoop the lava and fling it into a bucket and be like that fling technique is all about uh, like, do you have a good way of extracting mm. that fresh lava for study mm. Mika how's your fling technique uh, not very good okay well you you work on that <laughs> up with this i am much better with landslides primarily because i study them after they happen thus there is a very small trip of uh, chance of tripping and falling into the landslide and having sudden death yeah mm. we don't want that right yeah mm -hmm. i i am not a graceful enough walker to spend time near volcanoes my feet are not <laughs> that cooperative got it all right well any last thoughts before we end this call i i think i would like to at least visit this planet. I don't know if I'm ready to live there, but I'm intrigued by uh, by what we've developed. All right, yeah. Would anyone yeah. else want to visit it? I would. Can I say, I don't want to be that close to any volcano. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, they just, they have this unnerving habit of doing things like burping and hurling rocks and, like, killing entire field trips of volcanologists, and I really don't want to shorten my life expectancy, so I'll, I'll observe from orbit. Yeah. Okay. Take a lot of photos. Cool. Send robots. Yeah, I think I'm probably in the same boat. Um, so we've just built a world that I, I don't want to go yeah. to. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, but I would definitely want to see some stories, see some mm -hmm. art that is set in this world. So if, if any of you are artistically inclined, I would love to see what you create. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I'm going to end the recording now. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you. In case you couldn't tell, I had a really great time doing that discussion, and I now know enough about volcanoes to know that I definitely don't want to live anywhere near one. Uh, so since going into quarantine because of coronavirus, I 
have found it really difficult to stay motivated to do my work. So I've been reading like crazy, you know, all of those fantasy books that had been in my to be read pile for months. Uh, the problem, though, is that I went through those books way too fast. And now I don't have any new ones to read. And it's not like I can just go into a bookstore to get more. And so I've been relying really heavily on my knowledge of fictional world building to keep myself entertained. Uh, and if you are anything like me, and you have burned through all of your books and you'd like to start imagining your own fictional worlds, uh, definitely feel free to do art, to write stories, to draw pictures about the worlds that you see created in these XOLR videos. But if you're interested in learning more about the process and learning how to create your own fictional worlds, I uh, just released a video called World Building 101 where I teach you the basics of my process in facts-based world building. So check that out. Uh, and yeah, share any type of art that you create about this volcano world using the hashtag exolore and I'll see you next time on a different world.